All right, you guys put your hands together with us. Let's sing this together. Come on.
Good morning, New Horizon. How are you? Happy tax day. Except it's not. You got like two more days if you need it, so that's good. Or maybe it's not. I don't know. Let's just move on to happier subjects. Like how we're all people of the second chance. We're in our second week of that series. Yeah, that's it. Sure, why not? Let's clap. Let's just clap for no reason. Everybody, let's just clap. I can mess with you. Clap if you love Jesus. Pretty sure that's never been done in this church before, so... Oh man, I'm so off script, I don't even know what to talk about. If you're newer here, we're a little bit less creepy usually. Um, I'm not sure what's in it. Apologize for me. These people are a lot more normal than I am. So hang out with them, not me. Maybe. If you are new here, hang out with the uh, people at the VIP area. They're over there in the corner. They're not creepy at all because they have free stuff and answer any questions you might have and juice and muffins and all kinds of goodies. Or you can go there and then join us at the, not or, both and. So go there first, then come over and join us for new attenders lunch, which is right after today's service at 1230. So if you're new around here, come hang out, meet some other new people, meet some people who've been around New Horizon a while, hang out with the staff. And most importantly, it's free food. So there's a good reason to stay right there. If you haven't signed up, no problem. You can just go to guest services and check in, which is where you'll check in and then come hang out with us. A couple other things on the calendar you'll want to make a note of. Next Saturday, if you're a mother of a preschooler, which we call a mop, mother of preschoolers, our, the uh, Big Mops Summit is this Saturday from 10 to 4. You can find out more information about participating in that by emailing mops, M-O-P-S, at New Horizon Church. Dot TV, mops at New Horizon Church. Dot TV. So that's good stuff. And then Sunday, the 22nd, is our next ownership class, which is the night where you come in at 5 o'clock and you spend some time with us learning what it means to take ownership of the mission of New Horizon Church, which is to encounter God and engage in community. So you'll spend a couple hours with us, learn about that. It's a great ch- time to answer any, uh, ask any questions you might have about New Horizon. You know, why do we do what we do? Why do we not do some of the stuff we don't do? Things like that. And you can sign up at newhorizonchurch.tv. Of course, we encourage everyone, including those joining us watching online at newhorizonchurch.tv, welcome, by the way, to fill out the Connect card and let us know if there's any way we can pray for you or anything like that this week. Those of you inside the room will just drop that in the offering buckets when they come by here in just a few moments. Oh, there's one other thing I just forgot, and now I've remembered. Students, listen up. We've got 25 spaces available for a summer camp coming up in June, and you'll be able to register for one of those spots beginning next week at the Family Ministries desk in the lobby. So it's going to be a couple of days in June. At the end of June, it's going to be a great couple of days with some good speakers and some worship, and it's at Myrtle Beach, so that's plenty of fun there too. So if you want, what, oh, what ages? That's a good question. So rising 6th through 12th graders. So if your kid is heading into 6th grade next fall, then they'll be able to go to the camp as well. So 6th through 12th graders. Um, and if you're graduating 12th grade, you'll be allowed to go as well. Uh, you can always uh, find out more information on that and many other things by liking the New Horizon Church Facebook page where we keep all kinds of information flowing that way or on Twitter at NHC Durham. Whew. We're going to continue to worship by bringing our tithes and offerings. So if you need to get ready for that, go ahead and get ready. The welcome team will prepare to bring the the buckets around here. If you've already given online, appreciate that. That's awesome stuff. And when you give at New Horizon Church, we say this a lot, but we really do mean, and the truth is, when you give, you're given to life change. We're here to see people encounter God, engage in community. They will experience life change in Jesus Christ. And when you give at New Horizon Church, that's what happens. As evidenced by what happened last Sunday, in case you forgot, it was Easter. And 164, 164 people. I didn't even say what they did. 164 people had lunch. I didn't even say what they did. And you guys like, woo! 164 people said yes to Jesus last week. That includes students and teenagers. 49 people stepped forth and and publicly professed their belief in Jesus by getting dunked, by going forward in baptism. So that's awesome stuff. And if you give at New Horizon Church, you have ownership in that. Because what happened was we were able to create an awesome environment for somebody who's never been to church to come in 
and, and to hear the gospel and to be presented the truth and to respond to it. Because you gave, we were able to rent some shuttle vans and get some of the team members off site so that more guests could be on site parking. We were able to buy some awesome curriculum so that our kids were able to experience Jesus on their level. We were able to provide an awesome environment up in Spike so that teenagers could encounter God through worship and the Word and also engage in community with their small group leaders and experience what it means to follow Jesus. And 164 people, kids, students, and adults, said yes to Jesus. And because you gave, that happened. So never forget, when you put something in the bucket, when you point, click, and make a difference, you're making a difference in someone's life, both here on earth, but most importantly, for eternity. So let's remember that as we give today. Let's stand together. John's got a new song to teach you, and we're going to continue to worship together. Father God, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you so much for Jesus. God, for giving us a second chance, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and as many as we need. But God, most importantly, giving us the chance to be right with you through Jesus Christ, because you sent him to die for us. But you raised them to new life, and you raise us to new life if we would believe and accept that gift of salvation through Jesus. God, as we give, we're responding to that, and God, we're praying that you would use what we bring to help even more and more and more people know the love of your son, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Like you said, we got a new song we're going to do, and it's called White Flag, and I'm assuming you guys all know what that means. If you've ever seen Bugs Bunny or Looney Tunes, you know, you raise that little white flag up, which means surrender or defeat, and you know, in war, you raise your, you raise your white flag, you've been surrendered, you're a prisoner, you're a captive, and, but sometimes in God's kingdom, things are upside down from what it is in our daily lives, and so this song is not about that, it's about, it's about surrendering to God, and we're free, we surrender in victory, not in defeat, so let's sing this together knowing that we're surrendering to God, let's surrender to Him, surrender our lives, and there's a line that's really awesome, we lift the cross, when we raise our white flag, that's what we're really doing, we're lifting the cross, it's the banner of our lives, when we surrender to Him, so let's sing in victory. i uh-huh. 
Right, you can have a seat. <laughs> good morning. How y'all doing this morning? Good to see you back. Did you have a good week this week? Great day out there this morning. And we're in part two of People of the Second Chance. Can't get much better than that. Grab your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 15. We kicked off this series last weekend on Easter weekend. And uh, I know Jamie already said something about it, but Easter weekend was incredible, wasn't it? 164 people committing to Christ. That's amazing. Amazing day. Amazing day. And part of what we did last weekend was we kicked off this brand new series based on a story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15. And uh, while you're turning there, let me just ask you a question. How many of you like surprise parties? Surprise parties? Yeah, I'm not going to surprise you this morning, okay? You can put your hand up. It's safe. How many of you like surprise parties? Let me see. All right, all right. Yeah, I don't mind surprise parties as long as somebody else is getting surprised. I just don't like being caught off guard. I don't like being surprised. I like to know what's going on. I like to know what I'm getting into, kind of what's being involved in, what I'm being involved in. I just don't like being caught off guard. And usually it's hard to surprise me anyway. I'm kind of observant. I usually kind of figure those things out. I kind of see what's going on behind the scenes, so it's, it's hard to surprise me. But a few years ago, my wife got me with one. She put together a surprise birthday party for one of those birthdays that's kind of like a milestone birthday, you know, one of those birthdays that makes you feel old. I won't tell you which one it was, okay? But she really caught me with this one. She had it all set up at the clubhouse where we live. And uh, it, it all began with a couple of friends of ours coming by our house to ostensibly give me a birthday present. So they came in, they gave me the present, we sat there and it was kind of a gag gift and we kind of laughed and had a good time about it. And then they left. Well, a few minutes later, the phone rang, and it was those same friends, and they said, look, our car broke down. We're down here by the clubhouse. There's some people in the clubhouse. They let us in, so we're calling from the clubhouse. Could you come and pick us up? Now, what had happened between the time they left and the time they called was I decided to get comfortable. <laughs> it's my birthday. I want to kick back. I want to relax. So I've changed clothes. I've got on an old pair of gym shorts and an old worn-out workout T-shirt that's faded and got holes in it and all kinds of stuff. I, I looked pretty scroungy, to be honest with you. And the thought went through my mind, maybe I ought to change clothes. Then I thought, nah, they're close friends. They won't care what I look like. So I walked out of the house and into a surprise birthday party with 50 people in the room in my gym so shorts and a worn-out T-shirt. Can you say surprise? <laughs> Sometimes we get a little caught off guard by the party. And that's what we're going to see in the second part of this story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15. It's the story of the prodigal son. Last week we told the first part of the story, the story about the youngest son in the family who comes to his dad one day and says, Dad, just gather up all the stuff, all the money that I'm going to get when you die and just give it to me now. Because see, Dad, I'm done with you. I'm done with living in your house. I'm done with living under your rules. I'm done with you telling me what to do and what not to do. I'm done with you saying I can't have the camel on Saturday night. You know, Dad, I, I'm out of here. I want to live life on my own. Just give me the money so I can go. So Dad liquidates part of his assets, gives him the money, and he heads off for the big city where he engages in sex, drugs, rock and roll, spends all the money, ends up homeless, starving to death. And the Bible says he comes to a point where he has one of those V8 slap your head, mo forehead moments, you know, where you kind of go, ugh. I could be doing something different. I could have had a V8. No. <laughs> he 
He says, I could go back to my father's house and live there as a servant and be better off than this. So he makes the turn and he heads back for home, not knowing what to expect when he gets home. And when he gets home, he runs into a surprise of his own. Dad comes running to meet him, throws his arms around him, puts a new robe on his back, a ring on his fingers, sandals on his feet, and then proceeds to throw a big, I'm talking huge party. Okay? I'm talking about barbecued brisket, ribs, steaks, burgers, coleslaw, hush puppies, sweet iced tea. I'm talking about cornhole for the adults. A slip and slide for the kids and a DJ doing the cha-cha slide. It's a party, man. <laughs> All because of the graciousness of the Father. All because the, God, the Father is a loving Father. You know, and at this point in the story, uh, the, the people listening to Jesus, there's about half of the audience that's really digging this story about this point. Remember we said last week there are two, two, uh, two groups of people in the, in, the, in the room listening to Jesus? Group number one was the tax collectors and the sinners. They're like the worst of the worst. They're on the bottom rung of the bad people ladder. Remember we talked about that? And they're listening to this story and they're going, Wow, that's my story right there. I'm the prodigal. And you're telling me that God's going to welcome me home and give a party for me? Woohoo! I'm a person of the second chance. Fist bump, high five. They're digging it. But group number two over here, remember them? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law? They're kind of sitting over here scratching their heads going, we don't get it. I mean, this guy says he's from God, that he came from God. And if he came from God, surely he wouldn't be hanging out with those people. I mean, if he came from God, he would separate himself from those people like we do. I mean, if he really came from God, he would be hanging out with us because we are the really good, righteous people in the room. And Jesus hears this, so he moves on to part two of the story, and he aims part two right at those guys. He aims it right at the people who think they've got it all together. He aims it right at the self-righteous crowd. In other words, he aims it right at the hearts and minds of church people like you and me. So let's take a look at the story. We'll, we'll just read through the story, and then we'll come back and unpack it verse by verse and take a look at the implications for us. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has, who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The reality of the second brother, the older brother, is that he totally misses the heart of the father. And as a result, he misses the party. All because he's developed a case of what I'm going to call this morning elder brother syndrome. E-B-S. Sounds bad, doesn't it? And it is. And there are three characteristics to elder brother syndrome. Take out your notes section, take out your pen and pencil, and write these three things down as we go. First of all, the first characteristic is that he has a lack of joy. You know, one of the things that kind of distinguishes the older brother from the younger brother is the older brother is the good boy of the family. How many parents have we got in the room this morning? Parents? See your hands? Okay. How many of you have more than one kid? Let me see those hands, okay? All right, let's just break it down. How many of you have three kids? Oh, a lot of you, okay? How about four kids? Man, still a group of you. Five kids? You guys got five kids? <laughs> Y'all know what causes that, don't you? <laughs> Been reading the Song of Solomon too much or something. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody with six kids? You got six? Man, there's three, three four of you. Man. Seven? <laughs> I'm done, though. I'm done. <laughs> so you're done. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I was thinking we were going to have to pray for you here this morning or something. <laughs> you figured it out. Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> where was I? I have no idea where I'm even at now. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you have more than one kid, at least seven, <laughs> you know what this is like. There's always at least one kid that's the wild child of the bunch, right? We talked about that last week. It's usually the youngest child, and they're always into something, always causing a bunch of mess, doing something wrong. Sometimes you just wonder if they're demon-possessed or something, you know? But then it always gets balanced out by another kid who's the good kid of the bunch. And they always do everything right. They always follow the rules. They make good grades. Well, in this story, the elder son is that, that kid. He's the good kid in the family. He always does what dad tells him to do. He follows all the rules. He's stuck around. He's faithful to dad. In fact, when we, when we first meet him, he's out in the field working, busting his hump for his dad. But on this day, as he gets near the house, he hears something. Boom, jaboom, 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 jaboom. Subwoofers. <laughs> kind of like that sound you hear when that guy pulls up next to you at the stoplight, you know, and your windows are rattling. Boom, jaboom, jaboom. That's what he hears. And he notices all the camels double parked down the driveway of the house. And then he goes, I smell barbecue. And he looks around, and the fattened calf is missing. He knows something's going on, but he can't figure it out. So he sends one of his servants into the house to find out what's going on. And the servant comes back and says, dude, here's what's going on. Your brother has come home, and your dad is throwing a party to end all parties. Now, you would think at this point that he would be like his dad, that he'd go running into the house to find his brother and embrace him and say, bro, man, it's so good to have you home. I missed you. Where have you been? We've been worried sick about you. Man, I'm so glad you're home. But no, he's ticked off. He's angry. And the reason why is because he missed the heart of the father. See, he doesn't know what dad's doing. He doesn't know what dad's thinking. He doesn't even know where dad's at. He doesn't know his brother's come home. He's in close proximity to dad. He's hanging around the house. He's been with dad all this time, but he's disconnected from the heart of the father. Think about it. When we're first introduced to this part of the story, where's dad? He's in the house. Where's the son? Out in the field. Dad's out on the front porch every day, scanning the horizon, hoping to see if his son's coming home. Where's the other son? Out doing a bunch of stuff that he thinks is more important than that. Dad's in the house throwing a party. And the son's outside the house, refusing to come into the party. He's disconnected from the heart of the father, even though he's in close proximity. He's disconnected from the heart of the father, especially when he finds out what the father has done. Look at verse 27. Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Everybody say, safe and sound. Now that phrase comes from a Greek word that's kind of an interesting word. Let's throw it up here on the screens. It's the word hugiano. Would you say that with me? Hugiano. Say it one more time. Hugiano. Now that's the word we get our word hygiene from. Okay? Interesting. Jesus says he has him back with hygiene. So what does that mean? He threw him in the shower and gave him a bar of Irish spring? Scrubbed him down? No, the word hugiano goes much deeper than the our, our meaning of hygiene. Here's what it actually means. It means sound, whole, or complete. And it's actually an attempt to translate the Jewish idea of shalom into Greek thinking. Does anybody know what the word shalom means? Peace. But it's not just peace in the sense of absence of conflict. It's peace that comes through, the, uh, through a whole, complete relationship with God. That's what the word shalom means. And that's what the word hugiano means. So here's what Jesus is saying. The father has received him back safe and sound. Hugiano. He is at peace with the father because dad has made him complete, sound, whole. And that's what ticks off the older brother. I mean, after all, the young, younger brother is the one who humiliated them, dragged their name through the mud, threatened their financial future. And now he's going to be allowed to just be in the family again? And not just be in the family in the sense of, you know, like that weird family member that's in your family. You know what I'm talking about? Every family has one, right? A weird family member. And if you're sitting here this morning going, 
I don't. I can't think of a weird family member. <laughs> You're it. <laughs> you just didn't know it. But he's not being allowed back into the family just like the weird family member. He's being made sound, whole, complete. He's got the robe. He's got the ring. He's got the sandals. And now dad is throwing a party. And the older son is ticked. Let me stop here and ask you a question. Have you ever been ticked off at the party? Now, don't answer that out loud. That would just be weird if you did that. People would look at you strange. But have you ever been ticked off at the party? Because, see, here's what we do. We read the first part of this story, and we go, yeah, that's it right there. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Man, I'm a person of the second chance. I like the first part of that story. I'm the prodigal, and I can come home, party thrown for me. I'm all over that. We buy into the principle of God's grace. But in this story, it's not just a principle. For the elder brother, it's personal. And when the prodigal gets personal, that's when you begin to kick into elder brother syndrome and you begin to lose your joy. Here's what I mean. Take the prodigal out of the story. Put your ex-husband in there. Put your ex-wife in there. (laughs) And now it's getting personal, isn't it? Yeah. Because you were the one that was cheated on. You were the one who was betrayed. You were the one left holding the bag, taking care of the kids, taking care of the finances and all that. And now you're going, did I hear you say party? Barbecue and a DJ? No, 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 no way. Not going there. Take the prodigal out and put a parent in the story. A parent who said they would always love you, always be there, but then they walked out and abandoned you, left you. Or worse than that, put a parent into that story who abused you and left you with all kinds of garbage and baggage to deal with. And now, he's back. And he's going to church. Says he loves Jesus. He's getting up in front of the church, getting baptized. And all the church is going, wow, look at that. What an amazing story. People of the second chance right there. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And you're going... I don't think so. You don't know what he did to me. He's never apologized to me. When the prodigal gets personal, you lose your joy. Take the prodigal out and put a business partner in there. A business partner who made a backroom shady deal that you knew nothing about, and it sunk the business. And you got left holding the bag. See, when the prodigal gets personal, that's when we start to get ticked off. We start to lose our joy, and elder brother syndrome kicks in. And then we get the second characteristic moving into place, and that's that we begin to lose our focus. We lose our joy, and then we begin to lose our focus. Look at verse 28. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. He does for the second son the same thing that he does for the first son. He goes out to meet him. Remember when he went out to meet the first son? The first son had a little speech all prepared, ready to go, had it all written out, a little piece of paper stuck in his pocket. Second son's got a speech too. Look at verse 29. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He's got a totally wrong focus. Rather than focusing on how great dad is, how gracious dad is, how loving dad is, how forgiving dad is, and what a privilege it is to live in the household of a father like that. Rather than focusing on how great dad is, he's talking about how great he is. And here's what his focus looks like. It's all revolving around the what. The what. What I am, what I've done, what I'm doing, What I'm going to do, it's all about the what. And here's the reason he's so focused on the what. Because he thinks that is what determines the love of the Father. In order to get this, i got to do this. Got to have some what. And he says, Dad, in case you haven't noticed, i got a lot of what. I've been faithful. 
I stuck around. I've been working hard. I followed the rules. I've done everything you've asked me to do. I haven't blown the money. I haven't been hanging around with loose women and running to parties and all that kind of stuff. Dad, I got a lot of what, so that ought to get me a lot of love. And you see, if we're not careful, we slip into the same mentality in our relationship with God. That in order to get the love of the Father, the Heavenly Father, we got to have some what going on. So we say, God, look at all the what I've got. I go to church. I read my Bible. I serve on a team. I'm in a group. I tithe. God, I got a lot of what going on here. That ought to get me a lot of love. A lot of what? Or plug something else in there. What equals heaven? I mean, God, I got a lot of what going on. I'm a good person. I give to the United Way. I coach Little League, help little old ladies across the street. I follow most of the top ten. I you know, don't, don't follow them all, but I get most of them right. I mean, God, I got a lot of what going on. That ought to get me into heaven. I'm a, I'm a good person. Or what about this one? What equals blessing? God, I got a lot of this. I ought to be getting a lot of that. We think it's all about the what. And if we're not careful, we consciously or subconsciously begin to relate to God in that way. And when we do, it shifts our focus. We begin to t pick up two very negative types of focus. Okay, let's look at them. First of all, we start to have an entitlement focus. Look at verse 29. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Isn't it interesting the things that we expect God to give us? This kid wants a goat. Anybody here ever ask God to give you a goat? No? I'm glad. Because that would be really bad. I know, that's a bad joke too, yeah. But there's a sense of entitlement here. And here's what a sense of entitlement says. Why him and not me? Why did she get married and I didn't? Why did he get the job and I didn't? Why did he get the promotion? I've been working harder than he has. Why did she get the healing? I'm more spiritual than she is. God, I've got a lot of what going on. You owe me, God. Sense of entitlement. And then we develop something else. A different kind of focus, a comparison focus. Look at verse 30. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Notice what he calls the younger brother. This son of yours. He doesn't say my brother. He says this son of yours. Do you hear the judgment just dripping from that statement? Do you hear the sense of superiority? Because here's what he's doing. He's comparing himself to the younger brother, and he's coming out on top. And not only that, he's comparing himself to his dad, and he's coming out on top in that one too, because here's what he's saying to dad. Dad, if I were you, I wouldn't do things this way. See, here's what we do when we play this little comparison game. We take our what, and we take the best of our what, and we compare it to the other person's worst what. You know what I'm saying? I take my best what and compare it to your, best, your worst what. That way, I come out on top every time. But here's what's really interesting. Here's, it's really kind of weird. What the older son is accusing the younger son of doing is the same thing he's doing. He's saying, uh, uh, you know, about the younger son, you, he humiliated you. He shamed you. And the older son is doing exactly the same thing. Here's what I mean. Culturally speaking, in the culture of the day, whenever a family would throw a big party like this, guess who the party director is supposed to be? The oldest son in the house. It's his job to make sure the camels get parked in the driveway right. It's his job to make sure the grill's fired up and the steaks are being cooked right. It's his job to make sure that the servants got the right assignment, that the DJ has the music list that they want played. It's his job to welcome the guests. He's supposed to be the party director. And where's he at? He's outside the house, outside the party, refusing to even come in. So here's what the father has to do. 
He has to get up and walk through the middle of the party, walk through the house, go outside, and try to plead with his son to at least come into the party. This would have been absolutely humiliating for this father. It would have been a shame. People in the room would have just been sitting there in stunned silence, like, <sighs> they would have whispered to each other, do you believe what this dad has to put up with? First that son, now this one too. So you've got the older brother accusing the younger brother of something that he's doing himself. And again, that's what we do when we play this little comparison game. See, I look at my sins, my sins should be forgiven. I look at your sin, you should be judged. Even if it's the same sin. If I've got a sin in my life and you've got the same sin in your life, mine should be forgiven, yours should be judged. Let me give you an example of this, okay? How many of you have ever been cut off by somebody on the highway? Been cut off, okay? Now, I don't know what you do when that happens, but I'll be upfront and honest with you. I'll tell you what I do, okay? I pray for that person. I do. God, strike them with a lightning bolt right now. Send fire down from heaven. Consume that car, God. God, send a state trooper along to pull them over and give them field sobriety tests. I want to see it right now, God. I'm praying for them. And I'm honking the horn to let them know that I'm praying for them. Honk, honk. Hey, just want you to know I'm praying for you. <laughs> now, I know nobody else does anything like that, but that's what I do, okay? But now you reverse that whole scenario. I'm the one who cuts somebody off. They're now praying for me and honking the horn to let me know that they're praying for me. What do I do in that little scenario? <laughs> Sorry. I wave and smile like the wave and smile is the international symbol that everything is going to be okay. I'm sorry. When it's me sinning, you should forgive me. When it's you sinning the same sin, you should be judged. And that's the mentality that begins to develop. That's the elder brother syndrome. And that begins to develop when we lose sight of who God is and how gracious he is and how much grace he's poured into our lives. And then we kick into the third little characteristic of elder brother syndrome. We begin to lack perspective. We lose the proper perspective. You know, the father says to the son, you think our relationship's about the what? Let me give you a different word that gives you a little different perspective on our relationship. Verse 31. My son, you are always... What's the next word? Say it again. Everybody say it. With. You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. With. It's the most important word in this whole story because it gives us the perspective on our relationship with God. The father says, look, son, all you're concerned about is the what. What you've done, what you're doing, what you're going to do. Your, your, your younger brother's doing the same thing. All he's talking about is what he's done, what he's going to do different now. You guys are focused on the what. But here's my focus. With. It's about the with. I want to be with you both. I want to eat with you. I want to celebrate with you. I want to party with you. I want to be with you. Because, see, in reality... Here is what our relationship looks like, son. You think it looks like this? What equals love? Here's what it looks like. Love equals with. I love you. I want to be with you. Before you ever get to the what. I love you and I want to be with you. You think you've got to do this in order to get this. But son, already got this. I love you and I'm with you no matter what. And that means all of this, going to church, praying, reading the Bible, serving on a team, tithing, all this what? We don't do that to get this. We do this in response to what we already have. Because God loves me and is with me, I do the what? Now, for some of you, that's like a bombshell going off this morning. It's exploding in your mind and in your heart right now. You're telling me God loves me and wants to be with me no matter what? Yeah, no matter what. 
And that doesn't make sense. It's counterintuitive. It goes against everything in our culture. I mean, this would be like a school teacher standing up at the beginning of the year and saying to the students, students, I'm going to give you all A's all year long. I'm going to give them to you right now, beginning of the school year. Now make sure you do your homework all year. Be like a sales manager standing up in front of the sales team and saying, you know, we always give bonuses at the end of the year. We're giving them out at the beginning of the year. Make sure you keep your sales figures up all year long now. That doesn't make sense, does it? That, that's putting the cart before the horse. But that's exactly what God's grace looks like. I love you and I'm with you no matter what. If you're a parent, you should have at least some understanding of this. And I'll never forget the first moment I laid eyes on our little girl, Heather. The doctor was holding her, cradling her in his arms, and I couldn't be in the birthing process in those years, so I'm looking through a piece of glass looking at her, and he's holding her up. And the first time I saw her face, I just loved her. Nobody had to tell me to. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to decide to love her. And here's the deal. She did not have to do anything to get that love from me because I was her father. I loved her and wanted to be with her no matter what. And again, that's what God wants with you. He loves you. He wants to be with you no matter what. And that's good news. You know why? Because this story up here, this is nobody's story. There's not a single one of us in here that this is our story. Nobody in here can do enough, pray enough, be good enough, follow the rules enough, give enough, come to church enough, read the Bible enough. There's nothing that you can do to do enough of this to equal God's love. You can't do it. That's not your story. There's not a single one of us in here that has a story that goes like this. Well, I was doing really good. In fact, I did so good, Jesus accepted me. And then things got even better. No, that's not your story. It's not my story. Your story and my story is just like David's story. Look at what he says in Psalm 40, verse 2. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. You know what your story is? You know what my story is? We were a mess. That's our story. We were a mess, stuck in a slimy, muddy pit, mired in it. And Jesus comes along and gets down in the pit with us and lifts us out. And we did absolutely nothing to earn that. Nothing. Let me bottom line this for us all this morning, okay? You guys over here. Jesus loves you. And he wants to be with you, no matter what. You guys in this section, Jesus loves you. He wants to be with you, no matter what. Middle section, Jesus loves you. He wants to be with you, no matter what. Jesus loves you, and he wants to be with you, no matter what. Jesus loves you. He wants to be with you, no matter what. Do you get it? Do you get it? Because if you do, that changes everything. See, if I understand that, then I understand I don't have to strive, tr try harder, work harder, follow the rules better, earn it in some way. I don't have to do that because I've already got it. He loves me and he's with me no matter what. That's good news. This is not good news, but this is. And you know what this is? It's the gospel. It's the gospel. And if you will receive that by faith this morning, if you'll just receive this thought that Jesus loves me. He wants to be with me no matter what. If you will receive the gospel by faith today, Jesus Christ will save you. He will forgive your sins. He'll come into your life, begin to change you into the person you always wanted to be but never could be, and put you on a trajectory towards heaven and eternity with him. And not because of anything you've ever done, not because of the what, 
but simply because he loves you and he wants to be with you no matter what. Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm going to ask that no one be moving in this moment, please. Father, we are humbled today by your love. We stand in awe of your absolutely, totally amazing grace. To think that it's not about anything that we do, but that it's about the fact that you just love us. It's just mind-boggling. It doesn't make sense. But that's why we receive it by faith today. And Father, we pray today that none of us would be like the elder brother, that we would get focused on the what, but that you would help us to stay focused on the with, that you love us, you want to be with us no matter what. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment longer, please. Maybe you came here today, and for the very first time, this is all making sense. It's like the light bulb going off over your head, just bing, oh, I get it get it. It's not about what I do or don't do. It's about what Jesus did. He came in our direction to love us. He came into this world, was born sinless, lived a sinless life, went to the cross, died on the cross, three days later rose from the dead because he loved us and he wanted to be with us no matter what. And now all you need to do is receive that by faith. Receive the gospel by faith and Jesus Christ will change your heart and change your life. You know, the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone, that includes you, who calls on the name of the Lord, who just says, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need your grace. Jesus, I need forgiveness. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I need a Savior. Jesus, I need you to be my Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be, not might be, not your odds are good, will be saved set free, forgiven, changed, given eternal life. If you need to tap into that today, if you need to receive Jesus, you need to receive this gospel, this good news that Jesus loves you, wants to be with you no matter what. If you need to receive him as your savior today, I want to lead you in a very special prayer. And you can pray with me right where you're seated. You don't have to pray it out loud. But just pray something like this in your heart right now. Just just say, Jesus, just talk to him like he's here because he is. He knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. Jesus, I am a sinner. And I realize today that I can't do anything to make myself right with you. I realize today that I need a Savior. Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life and forgive my sins. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead so that I could be saved. Today I put my full faith and trust in what you did for me. I confess you as my Lord, as my God, as my King and my Savior. Jesus, from here on out, I'm yours. Father, I pray once again that you would help us all to grasp that truth today. 